Today I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, look into what to me is one of the most uh, challenging uh, group of scriptures for uh, Calvinism and that whole system. And there's a lot of issues that um, I, I find with Calvinism, a lot of uh, individual things that I think there are to address. But I found that this uh, particular issue that arises in Ephesians 1 really is the most gripping to me and, and is where I feel like I've, I've focused in the most on. I think right here, if we begin with this and we see and unpack what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 1, uh, we discover um, very quickly that, that the, the concept of unconditional election, uh, the concept that comes forth from Calvinism about God's sovereignty and what that looks like in salvation. Um, I, th I think this, these couple of few verses here that I want to look at pose some really serious challenges for that and, and really make it, uh, the, the system of Calvinism, a, a biblical impossibility, um, in my estimation. And so this is uh, something that if you've listened to or watched any of the, uh, the videos or content I put out about uh, Calvinism before, some of this will be a repeat, but uh, I wanted to look into this in a little bit more detail and, uh, and kind of describe why, why to me this is my, at this point anyways, this is my, my biggest issue with Calvinism, the issues that arise from Ephesians chapter 1. So as I've talk to different Calvinists who, who hold to that system and listen to uh, a variety of, of teachers teaching about it, um, what I've discovered and, and what seems to be revealed to me is a, uh, a basic lack of really of understanding the, the issue of union with Christ. Paul in Ephesians 1 will say that, that phrase, in Christ or in him, or in the beloved, uh, repeatedly. Um, I think he says it around 10 to 12 times in, in the first, um, I think, 14 verses of Ephesians 1. And so that, that issue of in Christ, that issue of union with Christ, is at the forefront of Paul's mind. I think it's the foundation of, of understanding everything he's saying in Ephesians 1 really, I think, has, has to uh, begin with an understanding of, of union with Christ and what it means to be in him. Um, but what I, what I found is that, you know, Ephesians one, uh, uh, four, we'll, we'll talk about how God chose us right before the foundation of the world. But the significant thing is that little phrase in him that is, that is attached to, uh, that, that, that sentence where he says that God chose us, but he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Um, it, what seems to happen to me is that this, this phrase in Christ is so often, um, overlooked or, or minimized, it, it's sort of set to the side. Um, I don't, I don't see a lot of uh, interpretation or, or uh, exegesis of what, what he's actually getting at when he says that this, this being chosen before the foundation of the world, he connects that to being in Christ. But it seems like the emphasis gets put on uh, God's choice of individuals. It gets, uh, it gets focused on these words before the foundation of the world. And again, the phrase in him or in Christ seems to be minimized or, or sort of set to the side as uh, a bit insignificant or, or less than important. And um, I'm not saying that's the, the case with, with every uh, Calvinist who would teach this or look at this passage. But overall, that's been my experience in conversations where there really isn't ever given uh, in my conversations with with others, I am never really given a uh, any sort of in depth uh, uh, understanding or or unpacking of of what Paul means when he connects in him, when he connects being chosen to being in him, when he connects before the foundation of the world, being chosen before the foundation of the world. Paul clearly connects that to in Christ, and so. Uh, so I, again, I would say I, I don't ever really hear communicated very well from, from people like, uh, John Piper, John Piper will talk about this, um, and actually in a, a sermon or an article of his that, that I've read through a little bit of and, and, uh, want to, uh, reply to hopefully soon in the future. But, but what I see in, in these sort of teachings is that 
I, again, I don't see an unpacking of this phrase in Christ. And again, it's kind of, sort of seems like um, in their mind is just sort of a fancy theological uh, a phrase that's tagged on there, um, but, but doesn't really hold a, a ton of significance in understanding what it means that God chose us before the foundation of the world. But to me, I think that we have to begin with union with Christ. We have to begin with this phrase, in him, in the beloved, in Christ. Uh, that is Paul's focus. That's the foundation of everything he's saying. All the things that he's describing in Ephesians 1 are, are, are uh, located inside of Jesus. And so I think before we try to understand what it means that God chose us, I think we need to understand and have some form of a, uh, a foundation of what it means to be in Christ. And, and so, so again, I'm not saying that none of these, these teachers have a foundation or understand what it means to be in Christ. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in relation, when they talk about this verse, um, in relation to Calvinism, and they, they use this as a proof text to prove the concept of unconditional election. Um, in, in those cases, I see this phrase in him, in Christ, minimized and not really, uh, addressed, not really given a place of significance in the way that they unpack, um, uh, the the truth here that God has indeed chosen individuals, but I don't see them uh, exegeting or explaining the, the again the phrase in Him and what that means in relation to being chosen by God, and so that's kind of what I want to look at and kind of as I do look at that and I I approach Ephesians one with an understanding of of what. Uh, I think the Bible communicates when it talks about being in Christ, what that means, when that happens, how it happens. Um, I think it reveals to me a, a significant challenge, a significant, uh, really uh, 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 stumbling point. And, and to me, I think it dismantles the, the, the doctrine of unconditional election and, and removes the whole basis of, of the possibility of, of Calvinism being true. Um, and so... So I say this a lot, but I, um, again, I want to make sure that I communicate that I, I love my Calvinist brothers. Uh, this is simply a point that I strongly um, disagree with on their interpretation of these verses, and I think it's significant. I think it's important to, to address these things, as you'll see why as I'm explaining this. Um, but I want to just go ahead and jump into Ephesians 1 and, and start to unpack this. So in verse 1 of Ephesians, Paul says, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. So immediately, Paul, um, he, he explains that the people who he, are, he is addressing are those who are in Christ. He, he's not addressing those who are out of Christ, but those who are in Christ. And he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. <clears throat> so I want to I stop at several of these places, and that mainly I'm going to focus on verses uh, 3 and 4. But before that, I just want to go ahead and read through this section so we get a, a, a good understanding of, of everything Paul is saying here. So he's, he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us, in him. So here's the third time we're seeing that phrase. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as son to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. So I think that's another way of saying in Jesus Christ. It was through Jesus Christ that he predestined us to adoption to himself. Um, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. So again, here we see that the grace, uh, so far we've seen that every spiritual blessing um, has been given us in Christ. Here here he's saying in verse 6 that the, the grace that God has to give, the grace that God has given us, he's bestowed that on us in the beloved, in Christ. And then verse 7, um, he says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. So the, his will, the mystery of his will, and his kind intention toward us, all that he purposed to be in him, in Christ. 
um, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Um, so if you haven't seen yet, as, I, as I've been saying, Paul has a very uh, locked-in uh, focus on this, 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 uh, this spiritual reality, the spiritual truth of union with Christ um, and, and being in Him. And he says that God actually, the plan, God's plan for the fullness of times was to sum up all things in Christ. So that means that all, all of God's activity, all that God does, all of His grace, all of His kindness, all of His working, He, he, he sums up all that he, He's done, uh, all of His redemptive work is, is summed up inside of Christ things in the heavens and things on the earth. So, so all physical reality, all physical redemption that needed to take place of the, the physical earth and, and, uh, and, and things in the heavens. I, uh, I think there's maybe a, a pointer there to the spiritual realities that needed redeemed and in the, the things that were out of order there and all of that got accomplished in Christ. And here again, in, in the last part of verse 10, he says again, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the fir first to hope in Christ, so there's, there's that phrase again, we're, we're in Christ and we're hoping in Christ, um, and this, this one here probably has a little bit more of a, a nuanced meaning to it, different meaning, but uh, uh, then he says, would, would uh, be to the praise of his glory. Um, in him... In verse 13, he says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So let's see, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So 12 times um, in the first 13 verses where Paul uses uh, a form of this, this phrase, in him, in the beloved, in Christ. So it's important. It's at the, the root of understanding all that Paul is saying. Um, um, I think this Jesus, this, this in Christ, in, in Jesus, he is the vine. He, he's the, the vine running through Ephesians 1 here. And all these other these blessings uh, that are being described, I think Paul, Paul talks about spiritual blessings, and they're all given to us in Christ. And then I think in verse 4, he begins to unpack those and go into a little bit more detail of, of the specifics of what those blessings actually are. But again, the vine is this, this, this understanding of what it is to be in union with Christ, what it is to be in Him. And so... So uh, I want to talk about that in just a really quick and, and basic way, uh, but I think it helps us to kind of grasp a little bit of, of what is being said here. So, so for those of you who are just listening, you can't see, but I have here drawn on the screen a circle. Um, and inside of this circle, I have the word, written, the, the phrase written in Christ. And so inside of this circle represents this spiritual location of in Christ. So so Ephesians and, and Colossians and other places will talk about how for believers, they were transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light or into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And so outside of this circle that I've drawn on the screen, everything outside of it represents that kingdom of darkness. It represents everything that is not in union with Christ, everything that's outside of him, uh, everything that's not connected to him, that is not, that is not in this location of in Christ. So let's look at, uh, again, at verse 3 and see what Paul says. Um, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So inside of the circle, what Paul has just said is that, that every spiritual blessing has been given to us inside of Christ. So everything you could possibly want from God, everything that he has to give, all all grace, all his kindness, all his love, all of his uh, favor and acceptance, and, and then all that goes with that, um, his spiritual blessing, all that is contained within the circle. God's will, God's determination, God's what God delighted in was to place everything that he had to give inside of Jesus. And, and then God gives Jesus to us and when we get Jesus, we get everything God has to give at one time 
in one place. Um, so I, I want to talk about what, again, what, what this means to be in Christ and, and again, just give a basic understanding. Um, so I think what the scriptures communicate is, is a basic way of looking at this is to be in Christ is to be in union with Christ or to be in relationship with them. Um, if you're in Christ, that means you're, you're not in Adam. You're, you are no longer defined by who you are in and of yourself and your, your, your DNA connection to Adam in, in the fall and all that goes with that uh, and the condemnation of your sin and fallenness, you're no longer defined by that in God's sight. But now, those who are in Christ, uh, Romans will talk about how we've been baptized into him. And so, so I think in a, a basic way, what that basic understanding of what that means is that your identity now is Christ's identity. God now looks at us not not uh, relating to us based on who we are in and of ourselves and what we are in and of ourselves, but God now relates to us on the basis of his son. When God sees us, he's not seeing us uh, in and of ourselves. He's seeing Jesus. He's seeing Jesus in us, and he's seeing Jesus covering us. Um, and so, so God can look at us, and that's why Romans says that while we were still weak, Christ died for us. When we get into this circle, when we get into Christ, we're not first getting strong and first becoming righteous and then then getting this acceptance and favor with God. But but what happens but what happens is that we are uh, we're placed into Christ uh, through faith. God places us in Christ and then uh, God, even even in our weakness, even even in our sin, even though you know, like uh, Paul will say that the the spirit is is uh, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is is life because of righteousness. So we get into Christ still with dead bodies, bodies infected with sin and fallen, and, and God doesn't wait for that to be for us to fix that before He allows us to get into Christ. But what He does is that. In that fallenness, in that weakness, in that sinfulness, through faith and repentance, God places us in Christ. And now, even though we are still, even though we are yet weak, we are yet sinners, God doesn't relate to us that way. He doesn't identify us that way, but he identifies us on the basis of who Jesus is for us and not on the basis of who we are in and of ourselves. And so again, a basic understanding or explanation of what it means to be in Christ is it means that you are identified with Christ now. It, it, it means that you, you have uh, placed faith in Christ so that God is now, you're joined together. You, it, it's uh, Romans 7, we'll talk about it in a marriage, uh, um, an, an analogy of marriage where, uh, and Paul says that in other places in Corinthians, that he's betrothed us to, to, uh, to Christ as a pure virgin. So to be in Christ, uh, one basic way of looking at it is to be in relationship with Him. It means that there's a living, active relationship. That there's a connection there. That you you you're not separate from Christ. You're not you're not over over on one in one spot, and Christ is far away from you. But you've been brought near. Um, you've brought, been brought near both to Jesus and to God. That Jesus has brought you near to God. Where there was a separation, you're now near. So to be in Christ uh, is to be in faith in Him to be in a living relationship with him so that, so that now God looks at you uh, through the lens of Jesus. And so, um, again, uh, in verse 3, he says that every spiritual blessing has been given to us in Christ. So the question that, that arises from that um, that I would ask is that if every spiritual blessing has been given to us inside, it's, God's placed it inside of this circle, well, then what is the condition to, to, to possess any spiritual blessing from God? If every spiritual blessing is contained within the circle inside of Christ, and if we are in need of spiritual blessing from God, if we're in need of, of blessing from God in any form, we need his grace, we need his forgiveness, we need his love, we need his acceptance. Where should we look? Where should we uh, or where should we be? in order to possess those things or to be able to grab hold of those things, to be able to inherit those things. Well, Ephesians 1 makes it clear that in order to get anything from God, in order to have any of these, these blessings, you have to be in the same location where these blessings have been dispensed. 
God has dispensed them inside of Jesus, inside of the circle. So if you want any of those blessings, um, it's not enough to simply ask God for those blessings and ask him to give you those individual things, but but the, the condition is to be connected to Jesus. And once connected to Jesus, once in him, we now possess, uh, uh, as a fruit of being in Christ, we possess all the spiritual blessings that are in him. So inside of this circle is every spiritual blessing. So I'll ask the question, outside of this circle, prior to union with Christ, prior to faith in him, what spiritual blessings does God have to give us? What spiritual blessings can we get or access from the Father outside of Christ or before this union with Christ? I think the obvious answer is zero. There's, there's nothing outside of Christ. If every spiritual blessing is in Christ, every the word every is exclusive. It means that there are no spiritual blessings that God has placed or, or grants or gives outside of Christ because God has a, like Paul, uh, or not like Paul, Paul, like God, has has a fixed view on Jesus in regards to the salvation and redemption of humanity. That God, God fixed his eyes on the person of Jesus. And First Peter will talk about how he is the chosen and elect, uh, uh, the cornerstone of God. So God looked at Jesus and he placed him in the way of man and said, this, this is the one place, this is the one thing I have to offer. Uh, everything I have to offer, everything you want from me, I place inside of Jesus. Um, and so if we want anything from God, where do we have to go? Jesus. And that's why Jesus says in the Gospel of John, nobody can come to the Father except through me. And I think that's another way of saying that every spiritual blessing has been placed in Christ. So any blessing you want from the Father, you have to get it through Jesus. So now if we look at Ephesians uh, verse 4, um, Paul Paul establishes that every spiritual blessing is in Christ, but now I think he goes into more detail in explaining and, and unpacking uh, what, what some of the specifics of these spiritual blessings actually are. So in verse 4 is where we get to the verse, um, a very popular uh, Calvinistic uh, proof text where it says he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we sh- should be uh, holy and blameless before him. So he chose us. Um, the question I would ask, and I think the answer is obvious, but is this this act of God choosing an individual uh, before the foundation of the world, is that accurately described? Would that, that fit into the category of being a spiritual blessing? Paul describes these spiritual blessings that God has given to us only in Christ, and then he describes this act of God choosing individuals before the foundation of the world. I think the answer is yes, that that's Paul describing in more detail the specifics of what some of these spiritual blessings are, and that's one of them, that God chose us. That's a spiritual blessing, that God, a blessing that, that Ephesians says has been placed where? Where is that blessing at? Where, where can it be possessed? Where can it be uh, uh, laid hold of? Uh, where, where has God placed that spiritual blessing of being chosen? Well, uh, I think if we just simply look at Ephesians 3, we know it's in Christ. And that's what he says in verse 4. He says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So this spiritual blessing of being chosen by God, it, it's not something that exists or can be possessed or that God bestows on individuals who are out of Christ, right? Who are not inside this location of Christ. That To, to say that the, the spiritual blessing of being chosen exist uh, for those outside of Christ, for those not in union with Christ, would be to completely be missing and going against what Paul ha- is saying here and establishing, that all that God has to give, he's placed it inside of Jesus. So nothing that God has to give can be can be gained or found um, outside of Christ. If you're outside of Christ, if you're not in him, then, then you can't be rightly said to possess this, this identity of being chosen before the foundation of the world. But this is, this is again, this is where the problem for Calvinism arises. And let me explain. So, so you can find specific quotes, and, and I can even provide some from John Piper, where, where the idea from Calvinism that it conveys is not, that, not a choice of God of, of individuals in Christ, but a choice of God that he, he chooses certain individuals to 
be in Christ. So in other words, that prior to individuals being inside of this circle, before these individuals were in union with Christ through faith, before they were connected and placed in Christ, that at that point, prior to union with Christ, prior to them being defined as those who are the, the faithful in Christ Jesus, as, as Paul begins this, this uh, passage with, that at that point in time, what Calvinism would communicate, um, at, least, at least the ones I've heard teach this, is that uh, they, they communicate a choice of individuals from God to be in Christ eventually. And I hope you see the difference there. One way I think that helps uh, reveal this issue and, and make it more clear is using a timeline. And so again, for those of you who are simply listening, you can't see this, but I have here drawn a timeline. And on this timeline are three points. So, so one point here in the middle is the point in time of, of a person's natural birth. So, so this timeline represents a person's life. Say this, this is a person who eventually is saved and believes in Jesus and is a Christian. But at this, there's a point in time where they're, they are born into this world, right? They're, they're born just, it's natural birth. And then, and then the other point on the timeline um, that comes later after that, at some, some point, depending on the person, later on in their life is this spiritual rebirth where they are saved, regenerated, and, and placed in Christ. So uh, at, uh, you got first on the timeline, you got physical birth, uh, and then later on in life, you got spiritual birth. This point here, the spiritual birth, is where uh, union with Christ happens. This is, this is where a person is placed in Christ. They, they put their, their faith in Jesus, they repent of their sins, and then they are identified with Jesus. They're baptized into him. And so it is only these people at this point in time, biblically, who are ever said to be uh, defined as, as uh, those who are in him or in Christ, uh, who are faithful in the beloved. That, that before this point in time, the Bible gives no room uh, or never, never gives the possibility of people being described as being in him prior to this point of time, uh, this point of faith and repentance, and then we're placed in, inside of him. But again, prior to that, the Bible never, never mentions uh, a, a sense or a form of being in Christ that exists prior to this point in, in time. You're either in Christ, according to the Bible, or you're in Adam. You're, you're either in the flesh or you, you have been, uh, you've been born again by the Spirit. Um, there, there's, as far as I can tell anyways, I, I can't think of any scripture. I've never come across a scripture that would communicate sort of a halfway point where you're, you're, you're sort of in Christ, but you're sort of not in Christ yet, or, or God sort of kind of identified you with Jesus, but he, he still kind of identifies you with Adam and, and with, with your sin and your fallen nature. Uh, that's just not the case. Biblically, you're either, you've either, either reached this point of faith and repentance, and now God has placed you in Christ or you're not and you're, you're simply of the flesh, you're, you're still dead in sin, you're still separated from God and, and cut off from Jesus. Um, Ephesians 2 will even say that it talks about the Gentiles, but prior to, to faith in Christ, uh, prior to, to all that, that uh, entering into a relationship with him, it says that they were separate from him. They were cut off from all, all the promises and covenants, which, which I think is another way of, of uh, going back to the spiritual blessings described in Ephesians, that those who are, who are not yet in faith and repentance, they're cut off. They have no relation to, no connection to any of the spiritual blessings of God, any of his, the covenants or the promises. Again, nothing God has to give does he give outside of Christ, but everything is in him. So, so here's the problem uh, that arises from Calvinism, is that Calvinism would somehow give to individuals the spiritual blessing of being chosen prior not only not only prior to this point in time on the timeline where where there's faith and repentance but even before natural birth right but so they would they would look at the words before the foundations of the world and take them in a literal way to say that before birth before a person even entered into this world physically and before a person ever repented and believed god looked at that person and he chose them so so i want you to think about this Again, prior to that point on the timeline where there was any faith or repentance, so no relationship with Christ, no union with Christ, this person has not yet been identified with Christ. They've not been placed inside that circle yet. 
what Calvinism would suggest, and not only suggest, but I, I would say that would, would clearly uh, flat out communicate and teach is that prior to that point of faith and relationship with Jesus, God looked at individuals and he chose them. And, and what you'll see described really it, it, uh, by Calvinism when they explain this unconditional election is an act of the Father where he looked at individuals and he bestowed on them elements really of, of mediation and reconciliation. So God looked at individuals who were not yet in relationship with Christ, but somehow there's this mysterious favor, this mysterious, uh, uh, again, I'll say elements at least of mediation and reconciliation that God bestowed on them, where God looked at individuals and said, this one is mine. He belongs to me. And every promise, every, every spiritual blessing I have to give is, is his, and there's no possibility that he will ever not get every spiritual blessing from me. So I see no other way to see that than to see it as a choice of, uh, of us, of God choosing us, not in Christ, but out of Christ. That really this is God choosing us out of Christ. Um, th- this, is, this is God, this is not the individual elect, the individual elect coming to God through Christ, right? They're, they're not first passing through Christ in order to get or access the Father, but somehow Calvinism gives this mysterious, uh, uh, we don't know why, we don't know how, but there's this mysterious access that, that individuals get to the Father where he, he binds himself to certain individuals. He, he, he chooses them. They belong to him. There's all these relational terms, these intimate relational terms that go with the, the doctrine of unconditional election that, that gives this idea of individuals somehow getting this special relationship with the Father prior to the Son, prior to union with Christ, and ultimately outside of Christ. So again, if we think about it in terms of the circle, where Christ is the circle, uh, and, and Paul says that every spiritual blessing, including being chosen, is in him. It's inside of Jesus. It's not outside. It's not prior to Jesus. It's not before a relationship and, and, and uh, this, this faith connection to Jesus, but it's inside that. Inside of that is, is, is where this, this blessing of being chosen is contained. It's inside of Christ. So, so if it's contained within Christ, if being chosen is, uh, think about this, getting in Christ is not contained within being chosen. <laughs> that, might, that, that might take a little bit of thinking about to, to think about what that means. But the Bible describes that being chosen before the foundation of the world is actually contained inside of Christ. So Christ, this location of in Christ, trumps these words before the foundation of the world. So in Christ is not contained within before the foundation of the world, but before the foundation of the world is actually contained in him. This blessing exists only inside of Christ, not outside of Christ. Ephesians 1.4 describes God choosing individuals not to eventually get into Christ. He's not choosing them and saying, I choose this one, and, and, and this one's going to be saved, and the way I'm going to save this person who I've chosen and, and who now belongs to me, the way I'm going to save this person is to eventually bring them into connection with Jesus. To say that is absolutely missing what Paul's saying. And I think it's to absolutely detract from the purpose, the, the supremacy of Christ in the doctrine of election. And what Paul instead says is that not that God chose individuals to eventually get into Christ or chose them to be in Christ at some future point in time, but the choice of individuals by God was absolutely conditioned on this phrase in Christ, that that the condition of being chosen is in Christ. It's in him. God chose people in Christ, not to be in Christ. God chose people in him, not to eventually get in him. And I hope you see that there's a, a significant difference there. One would have the, this blessing of being chosen completely conditioned on the person of Jesus in relationship to him. Uh, and so one, one of these interpretations would have getting this blessing of being chosen from the Father, it comes through Christ. The other would have this blessing coming directly from the Father to an individual. It's not really coming from Christ. Christ really is just an instrument 
that comes later down the road to complete or finish this, this initial act of salvation that has already begun on an individual where they were chosen before the foundation of the world. And then eventually uh, Jesus comes into the picture in their life and God kind of completes that, that, that initial act of salvation that he, that he started when before the foundations of the world, he bestowed on these individuals this blessing of being chosen and elect. But that is just not what is communicated here. And, and, and this, this is why this issue is so huge to me because I don't, I don't know how to see this as anything else other than the elect, the unconditional elect of Calvinism getting to the Father, not through Christ. That they're not passing through Christ in order to become, become the elect and chosen and to get that blessing from the Father. But instead, there's some mysterious way that this, this special relationship from the Father is being granted and bestowed upon these individuals. This um, salvific, I guess you could say, blessing. And, and again, elements of mediation and reconciliation, God's favor that goes with it. Uh, some of the, the, if you look at some of the words that um, describe the word chosen um, and election, if you look into those words, it, it conveys the idea of favor. So again, what Calvinism would convey is that God the Father bestowed upon individuals favor, special favor, special grace prior to and outside of Jesus. And to me, that's a significant, significant issue that, that might seem, it might seem uh, uh, confusing maybe or, or nitpicky or, or, or whatever uh, you, you might say. Um, I, I know this, this concept takes a little bit of thinking through and chewing on, um, but, but as I began to see this in, in Ephesians, it just, it just I, I can't see of any other way. When I, when I hear a Calvinist describe what unconditional election is, what that looked like, what it looked like for God to choose a person, the, the way it's described is always, uh, there's always such a disconnect from Jesus. It's, it's, it's not that Jesus is left out of the picture. Um, uh, he, he's, it's not like he, he's not mentioned or he's, he's not made significant to this act of unconditional election. That I'm, not, I'm not arguing for that. But what I'm saying is that, that it's, it's not an election that takes place in Christ, but, but it, it's more like God, God, obviously he has Jesus in mind, I think is, is uh, one of the ways that I've heard John, John Piper talk about this, is that God, he'll say that God saved us in relation to Jesus. Uh, at one point he, he says uh, a phrase like that, uh, but when I hear him say that, I, ha I have absolutely no idea what he means. I have absolutely no concept of what he means. Because then he'll go on to say things like, God chose us uh, w with Jesus in mind. Like, he, he chose us to eventually uh, be saved by eventually coming in into connection with Christ. So, to me, that is not a choice of God in relation to Christ not in the way that the Bible describes it anyways. That's a choice of, of, of individuals with Christ in mind. Yeah, you could say that, where, yeah, God has in mind that I choose this person and I have Jesus in mind that he's the one that ultimately is going to uh, uh, accomplish all this or to, f to finish out this sal salvific act of me choosing this person. But it's not a choice that's connected to Jesus. There, there's no living connection to Jesus to that individual whereby God is able to actually give them that blessing. On, on what basis is God giving to the individual elect the spiritual blessings of being chosen, being elect, being his own, his people, his sheep, those who belong to him? Uh, uh, and they'd even... Uh, interpret passages passages in John where where uh, where it says that there's many children of God throughout the world uh, who who would be brought into one I'm, I'm totally butchering that verse but I think you'll you'll know the one I'm referencing and so so even even unconditional election when it's explained will sometimes uh, communicate this idea that that not only are the elect elect and chosen but 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 the right definition would be to say that they're God looks at them as his children who are scattered abroad and lost in the world. They're his children. They belong to him. They're his sheep. And I would say the Bible, it, it just, it leaves no room for an inter interpretation like that. If your interpretation of election and being chosen by God is resulting in a view where it has the elect having some form of mysterious favor and elements of mediation and reconciliation from the Father, 
in eternity past prior to um, um, their faith in Jesus. And let's not even say before uh, in eternity past. It's, it's not even about how, how broad of a time span there is. But, but they'll even say at the time of birth, an individual is not in Christ yet, right? When a person is born into this world, they're not in Christ yet. God hasn't placed them in Christ. But yet, any Calvinist would say that at the point of birth, that person is elect and chosen. You could walk around the world, and if you knew who they were, you could point at an individual who's, who God has chosen and say, did you know, like if somehow God had given you the special knowledge, you, you could say, did you know that you're actually chosen by God, that before you, even, you were even born, he placed on you this, this privilege, this blessing, this favor, uh, that you, you actually belong to him. You are his. You may not know it yet, but you actually belong to him. Well, the Bible would say, if you just turn to Ephesians 2, that before faith in Christ, before union with him, we were actually separated from Christ. We, we, we were without God, is what it'll say. We were without God. We were without hope. We were separated from all the covenants and promises. We were separated from God. Um, uh, Romans 8 will say that, that those who do not have the spirit of Christ do not belong to him. So, so I mean, this is, this is a little side rail that I, I want to deal with in further videos, but when you think of the Calvinist's concept of unconditional election, that the unconditionally elect are God's sheep in, in the Gospel of John, who, who Jesus' sheep, right? They'll say that the unconditional elect are Jesus' sheep. Well, Romans 8 says that those who do not have the Spirit do not belong to Christ. Uh, uh, and then in Galatians, it'll say that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In First John, it'll say that those who are of God, those who are of him, who belong to him, are those who do not practice sin. So the Bible has a very, when it clearly describes those people who can be rightly said to belong to God, it says that if you belong to God, you are those who are in the light. You can't simultaneously belong to God and be in darkness and be a child of darkness. You can't simultaneously be the unconditionally elect who God has chosen and you belong to him at the point of birth, but yet at simultaneously the Bible describes you as without God, separated from Jesus, separated from all the promises of God, without hope and without God in the world. Um, I, there's, in my mind, I, I don't see of any way of looking at that other than saying that that's just a clear, clear, clear contradiction. That if you are interpreting the the idea of how of who the elect are and how a person becomes elect, if your interpretation of that leads you to a conclusion that says that at the point of birth, prior to faith and repentance, and that act of God placing you in Christ, at that point in time, you had this spiritual blessing of being chosen by God. You had this spiritual blessing of belonging to him, um, of being his, his, his sheep. Um, that, that just does not fit with scripture. And so I would say that interpretation, I, I would just encourage you to consider these verses uh, and, and, and encourage you to think about this concept that, that ultimately what that is doing is, is that is an election, not an election in Christ. That is an election in the father. Uh, um, I feel, I feel like that is, uh, the father again, giving a special mysterious entering into a special mysterious relationship with individuals, uh, that are getting access to the father, not through Christ, but outside of Christ, uh, without Christ and before Christ. Again, thinking about that timeline, a person is born they are, they've not yet reached that point of faith and repentance where God, where the Bible clearly says that is the point where God places a person in Christ and they've been baptized into him and now they're identified with Jesus. Prior to that, to that point in time, they're not identified with Jesus. When God looks at a person prior to that point of faith and repentance, he very clearly in his word describes the way he views that person. And when God describes people outside of Christ, he does not describe them as being his own, his possession, his, his, those that belong to him, his chosen ones. The only time you see that kind of description placed on an individual, it's describing, like Ephesians 1, 1 through uh, verse 1, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. And this all goes back to, to the simple words of Jesus where he says, nobody comes to the Father but through me. And Paul, Ephesians 1, 3, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And uh, to finish this out, one more, one more place that kind of makes this all 
clear is Colossians 2, um, where, where Paul says, uh, as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. An election uh, that takes place in the Father, when, when a doctrine is coming forth that's saying there is an election, that, that what, what biblical election and, and predestination looks like is God the Father bestowing these privileges, these blessings onto an individual out, who are yet outside of Christ. That is a doctrine that, that it, it, I think is clearly uh, being described here that is not according to Christ. It's not according to the truth revealed about the supremacy of Jesus in all things. Uh, it, it's not, not a doctrine that's being unpacked, that is, that is unpacking the person of Jesus and all that is in him, and then discovering the truth about, about election and predestination. But rather, it, it's a predestination and election and a, a chosenness that is, that is outside of and disconnected from Jesus. It's literally on, on the timeline, if you look at that, it's before union with Christ. Again, I, I know that a Calvinist would not put Jesus completely out of the picture in, in this scheme of things. But again, as the most you could really say about how Jesus was, was related to a, an individual being chosen was, was not that it was a chosenness in Christ, but it was, it was God choosing an individual, an individual with Christ in mind, right? He had, he had Jesus in view in the future. But again, looking at that timeline, they weren't in Christ yet. They weren't connected to him. And so the benefits, uh, uh, the, the, the spiritual blessings that they're receiving in their election, they're not being sourced out of the vine, out of Jesus. They're not, they're not coming forth from being connected first to the, to the vine. Uh, Jesus says that he, he is the vine, we are the branches. A branch cannot have any fruit. It can't contain, it can't bear, it can't, it can't uh, possess the fruit of, of election and being chosen if it's not first connected to the vine because, because God has placed all spiritual life, all spiritual blessing, uh, anything that we can need or want from God, he's put that in the vine. And, and it's only those who are in the vine who are connected to that vine in a living relationship, a living faith that, that, that get the benefits of the vine. And one of the benefits of, of Jesus is this blessing of being chosen. Uh, how, how uh, I, again, I can't, I can't see anything else but to say that Calvinism makes the, the blessing of being chosen not a benefit uh, of union with Christ, but a, a, a uh, really it's a condition uh, upon which we, we, must, we must first contain this blessing, we must, or we must first possess this blessing of being chosen so that later on we can, we can get Christ. But but that's not that's that's not a blessing that's coming forth out of a, a connection with Christ. It's not a that's not flowing forth out of a living relationship, a living connection to Jesus. Uh, rather, again, I, that's I, I don't know how it would be explained, but it's just simply an act of the Father mysteriously giving this blessing, uh, this blessing that it's something different than Jesus. It's just it's 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 not Christ Himself that He's giving to that individual at that moment, um, and, and with Jesus. Jesus, uh, with the vine, out of that is coming forth this blessing also of being chosen. Rather, it's a separate blessing from Jesus. It's the separate blessing of God's election and him giving the special favor to individuals prior to faith in Christ. I, I have yet, I would say, to find uh, a good answer to this from a, a Calvinist in all the conversations I've entered into with them. Um, I want to talk a little, little bit more about that before I end, but, but closing with this verse, Colossians 2, uh, verse 9, it says, For in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. If God has put his fullness, all the fullness of God, is inside that circle in Christ. That is where God was pleased to put everything that he has to give, everything we, he would want. And that includes being his elect, being his chosen. 
He's placed that inside of Christ. And it says we've been filled where? Where does Colossians say we've been filled or we've been made complete? In him, in Jesus. Hold on, Jonah. Go watch the show for a minute. I'm almost done. And where has God filled us up at? Where has God filled us up at? In him. So then again, the question, when do we get in him? Well, well, the Bible is clear. We get in him at that point in time of faith and repentance. That's where we're, we are included in Christ. Uh, and, and that's what, the, if you look at the NIV at verse 13 of Ephesians 1, it says, you also were included in him when you, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So at the point in time where a person hears the gospel, uh, believes and responds to it, it's at that point in time where God seals him with the Spirit, and only then does God say, this one is mine. God is then, the Holy Spirit is that stamp, right? That stamp of approval, the seal, where he's saying, this one belongs to me. This one is my elect and my chosen. But do you see how if first the condition is being connected to Jesus, and out from that uh, flows the, the blessing of being chosen and elect, uh, do you see how that, that makes Jesus, again, the vine? He's the vine, he, he's the, and being chosen is simply a fruit of Jesus. Being chosen is not something, it's not a form, it's not a step of salvation in and of itself. God doesn't have two steps of salvation. He doesn't have the first step of being chosen and the second step of Jesus. He has one step, and that's the person of Christ. He says all of his fullness, we've gotten that in Christ. If God has given us fullness in Christ, then what has he given us apart from Christ or without Christ or outside of Christ? We haven't, re- nothing, right? It, to be, to, for something to be full, it means it's lacking nothing. It has nothing else that is needed. And that fullness has been given to us inside of this circle, inside of Christ, not before Christ, not outside of him, not without him. There's, there's no special uh, f- uh, uh, section of that fullness that the Father gave us uh, uh, mysteriously uh, to us as individuals prior to that connection to Jesus, because all that, all the fullness of God, he was pleased, says in Colossians 2, he was pleased to place that fullness, all God's fullness, all he has to give us was placed inside of his son. And if you want any of that, if you want to partake of that, if you want to get that, that fullness, the, the condition is being in him. And again, that's why I say when you read Ephesians 4 or 1-4 and you interpret that, where he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Look, I acknowledge that the, the phrase before the foundation of the world is, is in that, that sentence. And that's important. That's significant. That's huge. That's awesome. And so is it the, the fact that it says he chose us, right? He chose us individually. Um, he looked at me and he chose me. Uh, as an individual, but you you cannot take verse four. You, you you've got to do something with that phrase in him. You, you can't minimize it. You can't make that an afterthought. That has to be the 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 starting point of, of understanding what he means by that and and how what does this chosenness mean? What does it mean that he chose us before the foundation of the world? And, and I say you got to begin with that that phrase in him. Because that's how Paul begins. He begins by saying, look, guys, I'm about, I'm about to, to, to describe and explain and unpack multiple spiritual blessings that you now possess. But, but I'm going to make clear that God has only given these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ, not out of him. You have nothing outside of him. God wants our focus to be uh, undivided on Jesus, right? That's what Paul says. He said said to the Corinthians, I'm afraid for you that somehow as a serpent deceived Eve, so also your minds may be led astray from a simple, pure, undivided devotion to Christ. That's so easy to happen. It's so easy for all of us for that to happen in theology. I, I know there's areas where, where that happens for me, where, where, where I get divided. You know, we can even get distracted and our gaze gets foc- focused on things, on other things. Even they might be good things, but it's not Jesus. Uh, and it's so significant. One of my favorite verses in Colossians is where Paul says the phrase, him 
we preach, right? Paul wasn't going out and preaching the doctrines of election. He wasn't going out and preaching uh, Arminianism or, or, or things. Paul wasn't preaching things. He was preaching a person. And as he preached that person, uh, whenever, whenever he would, he would the, the doctrines of election, the doctrines of, of, of free will or, or God's sovereignty, whatever doctrines Paul would explain and teach, those were all an, an unpacking of the person of Christ. Paul only had one thing to present to people, and that was the person of Jesus. And in him, he, there, obviously, there's a ton of things to unpack and to discover, but, but we must understand that all of it is contained in Jesus and not outside of him, not before him, not after him, but in him. And that's why G Jesus says, right, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Um, I, I have to stress this, election from the Father God the Father choosing you was not the beginning of your salvation. Jesus, and so I, I can already hear somebody like John Piper getting on me, and I, I, we would, I would love to have a conversation with him about this. Maybe the Lord will allow that one day. Jesus is the beginning, not election. Jesus is the first, not, not predestination to being chosen. Whatever way, whatever way you want to unpack that and explain how that works, uh, 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 you know, we can we can discuss that. We can look into that more. But the simple fact is that Jesus says He is the beginning. He is the beginning of our salvation. He wasn't a, a, a further point down the road. He wasn't some point later on in the timeline where first we had this this aspect of salvation of being chosen from the Father, and later on down the line we got to Jesus. That is to absolutely make Jesus not the beginning. That's, that's to make him maybe like a, a second step. Um, Jesus was the beginning. Again, I don't, you, can, you can take that and interpret that how you will, but that's what the Bible says. And so I believe that, that Jesus is the beginning, not me being elect from the Father. Um, um, but, but somehow Jesus was the beginning, and out from Jesus flowed this blessing of being chosen by God. And it wasn't the other way around. It wasn't that the blessing of Jesus flowed out from or was a fruit or a result, a result of this act of God choosing us. Do you see how that, that absolutely turns it upside down? Do you see how the person of Christ is absolutely minimized in that and, 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 and lowered and degraded? Jesus was the first thing for me. And, and election, I, I, I can't stress this enough, election is the fruit of Jesus. Jesus is not the fruit of election. Election and being chosen comes forth out of a connection to the vine, which is Jesus. And, and Jesus is not a fruit or, or a result that comes forth out of uh, uh, the spiritual blessing of being chosen. So there's a lot more that can be said about all this. Um, I, I think this has probably gone uh, long enough for this video, um, and I hope you will uh, at least consider these things. Don't take my word for this, but be good brands, search the scriptures, see if these things are so, and uh, uh, look into these things. Uh, this, this, to me, is a... Uh, uh, an unpassable hindrance to me, you know, at this point to, to even considering the possibility of Calvinism being true, because I feel like on this one, uh, fundamental point, it just, the, the, the concept of unconditional election just absolutely fails and presents a giant issue of special mediation and reconciliation, at least elements of that in favor and relationship with the father that is not contained in the person of Jesus. And, and that's just an issue to me. I have been discussing this with uh, some of the guys at Apologia Studios, if you're familiar with them, um, and, and talking with them on Facebook and, and still waiting for a reply on this question that I put before them. Um, I, I know that they're, they're busy and they probably get tons of emails and, and messages, and so um, I don't really blame them for uh, not getting back to me in, in a uh, really quick quick manner, but I am hoping to be able to dialogue about this more. And they, they actually, on, on one of their videos about um, Calvinism and Catholicism, they, they brought up this question. Uh, Pastor Luke mentioned the conversation he's been having with me, and he presented this question. Uh, Jeff immediately uh, revealed that he did not understand this actual issue that I'm raising, and he, he, he kind of even said that. Uh, Jeff Durbin said, uh, that he didn't he didn't see the problem, and then they kind of went on to give an explanation that that basically said 
uh, the question doesn't understand that, that God isn't limited by time. And, and, and so they, they said a bunch of things that ultimately didn't really address this issue that I've raised. And, and so I'm, I'm hoping to be able to pull up that video maybe on the next one and, and uh, play through some of those clips and, and maybe reply and explain kind of what was being said there and, uh, and show how this, this problem that I presented still remains. Um, and so, so again, I'm still waiting for them to get back to me on that. But, uh, but I say that to say, I feel like this is a solid uh, and significant uh, way of challenging Calvinism. And, and I have yet to find somebody who will take this and, and actually give a response that, that solves this issue um, that, 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 that makes biblical sense. And so, so I hope to do further videos, not only on this, but, but on uh, many more topics uh, concerning Calvinism and, and other things too. I want to get to other things in the Bible and not just focus on this um, uh, issue of Calvinism. And so I plan to do that on the, in the future. So if you're blessed by these, if you enjoy these videos, uh, go ahead and follow us and you can, you can find more stuff, go to greatlightstudios.com to find more content. Um, great light studios is primarily a filmmaking ministry. We make films that, uh, uh, the Lord's put it in my heart more than anything to make films that tell stories that magnify the person of Jesus and lift him up in a unique and powerful way. And so you can go to great light studios Com, um, or to our YouTube channel to find those films and to find, if you're listening on the podcast forum, you can find video versions of these on uh, YouTube or again, greatlifestudios.com. If you want to ask me anything about these videos, if you want to ask questions, if you want to tell me uh, I'm wrong and, and present your thoughts, I'd be more than happy to hear you out and to talk with you about this stuff. You can uh, message us at contact at greatlightstudios.com. That's contact at greatlightstudios.com. Uh, you can also get with us through our Facebook page and, and stuff like that. So, so um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you will continue to listen and uh, uh, pray that um, the Lord will use this um, in your life and those who, who hear it to ultimately to bring glory to himself and to bring people into a deeper revelation of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm.